Uh, two minutes past two, so we could probably give it a start. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, day one of this uh, introduction to uh, quantitative uh, time diary analysis uh, workshop uh, that is jointly co-organized by the Center for Time Use Research uh, and uh, the UK Data Service. My name is Pierre Walteri. I am a research fellow uh, at the Center for Time Use Research and a research associate at the uh, UK Data Service. Um, we are going to go through um, a number of things today. But the, the first thing I wanted to uh, check with you is that you have uh, signed the, lic the licensing agreement so that you can use the uh, MTOS data that we are going to uh, practice, uh, to use for, for practice exercise later on. Uh, so if you are if you haven't, uh, please uh, do it now. I am going to share again uh, the link in the chat. Uh, if I find the road, yes. So I am sharing this again. So that is the form that you need to fill in order to be able to uh, use the data for the exercise. Uh, it's. Ah, yes, it's here. Uh, again, if you haven't filled in that form, please fill it in now so that you can use legally uh, the multinational time use uh, study data for the exercise. Um, so, um, so the course material will consist uh, in presentation slides that I will show and comment on uh, this afternoon. And then uh, when uh, we will reach the practical, uh, you will be able to download some data. I will share it maybe during the first break today. Um, data that you can then uh, try to work with on your own computer. Uh, there will be a workbook um, and more generally, the, the, the course material uh, available on GitHub. I will share the link as well uh, during the, the break uh, in about 45 minutes so that you can uh, download what you need on your computer. Okay, so that's for the practical uh, uh, aspects of what we are going to do today. So now maybe... I am going to uh, go a little bit more in depth into what we will be doing today. Okay, so as you are aware, this is a two day uh, course. So today, unfortunately, it may be the most, the more boring one of the two days because this is the day during which I am going to uh, talk the most. Uh, it's uh, unavoidable that uh, some, uh, 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 some background and uh, uh, some uh, maybe milestone of time diary uh, research uh, is uh, part of the of what uh, what is being taught to you today. Uh, but we will uh, promptly move to more practical hands-on sessions in which you can uh, yourself uh, discover and uh, play with uh, time diary data. Today, as I said, we are going to. Uh, I, I will. Uh, probably spend uh, uh, the first session uh, mapping out uh, the origins and milestone of time diary research. And then we'll have a short break. And then I will uh, talk about uh, more specifically uh, the structure and design of time diary data as it is uh, available in most uh, common uh, time diary surveys. And then the last session, and maybe if uh, uh, I spend uh, less time uh, during the second session, uh, we may start during the second session, we will start uh, computing simple time use estimates. Uh, next week, we will uh, mostly spend our time uh, on uh, the laptops. Uh, 
uh, computing a little bit more advanced data visualizations, tempograms, uh, looking at specific uh, time diaries that are called work schedules, and uh, also um, uh, examining issues around data quality and weighting. And if we have the time, we'll do also some uh, attempt at multivariate modeling using uh, time diary data. So this course is tweaked or is uh, uh, targeted at intermediate users. So we will be using uh, R for the demonstrations, as well as assuming some basic uh, in uh, knowledge of statistical uh, concepts. Uh, however, we won't. I won't have the time to uh, explain uh, issues or how to use R. So, if you're not familiar with R, uh, bear in mind that uh, yeah, we'll have the time maybe after the session to uh, try to reproduce what I will be demonstrating. However, the, the syntax that I'm using we, we, is certainly not uh, uh, very difficult. Okay, so that's all for uh, the this starting point. Now I will jump immediately into the first uh, presentation. So I am assuming that everyone can see this properly. Sh give a shout if you have issues uh, visualizing the slides. Uh, if you have questions about what I'm going to talk about during the presentation, please uh, add them to the Q&A uh, or tap them in, in the Q&A uh, space of um, Zoom and I will try and answer them as I, as I see them. Great. Okay. So uh, to start with uh, time diary uh, or time you study, maybe we may we may probably need to uh, get a reminder that humility is something quite important. Time may be uh, uh, by comparison with other things, we or the phenomenon we are trying to measure capture with quantitative social science is maybe the ones that is that lends itself the, the least easily to such uh, quantification. And this is of course inspired. This image is of course inspired by Salvador Dali. Okay, so. Uh, I am basically uh, going to talk about three things here. Uh, brief history of time use studies. Uh, I will present uh, the main features of time use surveys and time diaries as used in quantitative in most uh, quantitative studies. And then I will show uh, maybe oh, I will, as an example, uh, typical uh, kind of analysis that we can do with time use analysis or with time use data. Okay, so we'll start maybe with a big question. What is time? Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, physicists have their own answer to that question, but from the point of view of social science, um, there hasn't been actually that many uh, attempts at theorizing uh, time. One of the most uh, famous person uh, who's uh, studied time from a sociological theory point of view is uh, Barbara Adam. Uh, and uh, she, we, she has uh, considered or proposed that time is uh, or should be considered as an implicit knowledge. It's something that we uh, all know about, but we actually struggle a little bit to uh, define or explain what we actually mean, understand, feel, experience uh, precisely. However, she proposed two uh, kind of uh, uh, approaches to time. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, what she calls a delimited time. Uh, basically, that is a time that indeed we can measure and divide or that we have uh, in the course of 
uh, the um, uh, recent history of uh, humanity uh, increasingly measured and divided by clock calendars and other devices. Uh, delimited time is, and at least uh, with the rise of Western civilization, uh, increasingly uh, seen as universal and following invariable rhythms. So each day has the same length, the same, uh, and months are the same everywhere. And also the idea that time is a limited and uh, often commodified resource, especially, of course, in capitalist society, in which increasingly, again, a speed and optimization of time, doing the most with the time we have, is um, uh, valorized. On the other hand, there's also what she calls contextual, contextual time. And contextual time is basically the time that we experience uh, in, in a more of an implicit way without being really able to uh, uh, measure it very precisely as we do with a clock. Uh, and it has different aspects. So there, there's, uh, there's the idea that uh, there's a natural dimension to it. We all experience seasons. We all experience planetary cycles, and we all we are all subjected to it. There's a new direction uh, which is always the same and uh, which is irreversible. And also uh, this uh, contextual time. Uh, is not unique. There are different experiences of it depending of who we are. Of course, there are, uh, we can see different cultural experiences of time uh, across societies, but also uh, between uh, other beings. Things as even if you don't uh, think much of trees, think of the experience of time from the point of view of a tree as opposed to that of a butterfly, for example. So all these beings have different experiences of time. We are not going to talk much about trees today, but it was just a, a, a way to put in to perspective and uh, the, what we are trying to work with here. Not needless to say, we are go, the, the time diary research is mainly or only preoccupied with delimited time, even if it's only one aspect of time. Okay, so uh, how has been time studied in sociology? So time has been studied as a uh, either an intrinsic object of study, time for the sake of it, so so to speak, uh, which may be probably not the most common way you may have encountered it if you have a social science background. So there's been you know, some work in social theory looking, for example, at acceleration of time in modern societies or social times and social rhythms. What are the times we share with others and uh, what is the trend uh, as uh, in our societies with shared time, is it more? Is there more and more or less and less such uh, shared social time? Um, and also uh, maybe uh, looking at the classic of um, sociology, there's been also a, a discussion of uh, the role of time, measuring time. Um, as a way or as part of the ongoing rationalization process of uh, modern society. Um, I can see that someone is asking for the slides, so I could probably uh, share the GitHub page here where they are. I'm going to share them in this chat. Okay, so uh, you should see the two files that I'm using for the slides on this GitHub repository, if you want to see them now. Okay, I'm going back to the presentation. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so 
uh, as I said, uh, time is an intrinsic object of study, but also, uh, and this is where we are going to um, spend uh, a little bit more time, uh, time as a tool to investigate so other social issues. In a way, time as an instrument. We study time uh, as a way to uh, get a better uh, understanding of other social issues. You are, I'm sure, aware of uh, what I mean here. So uh, a broad area uh, in which a lot of time has been spent uh, looking at time is productivity, uh, organizational studies. How can we maximize the production or productivity of workers? Uh, one of the precursor of such um a uh, study of time were in the 1920s, the scientific organization of labor. So people who were trying to uh, time every single gesture uh, workers were doing in, in, in factories, in large scale factory, manufacturing factories. Uh, there are more subtle ways of looking at that nowadays, but this is still a preoccupation uh, in, across some uh, areas of organizational studies. Um, time is a way also to look at inequality. So uh, there's the issue of time poverty. Uh, people who are able to buy other people's time who themselves may have uh, not time or not enough time to uh, do uh, in, uh, the essential of uh, reproductive work uh, in, in their life. And also uh, uh, an area that has been written a lot about uh, in relation to time is the gender division of labor within the household. And uh, we'll definitely come back to this later. Uh, but for a long time, uh, th these uh, attempts or interests uh, were limited to uh, anecdotal evidence or, or limited evidence because of a uh, lack of systematic uh, large-scale empirical uh, data. So what we can see, uh, and it's partly uh, mirroring what I've just said now, uh, there's been a growing interest or there was a growing interest uh, for a systematic study of time of the way people spend their time uh, across or alongside uh, the 20th century. Um, so I, I will refer you to uh, uh, the book written by Gershuni maybe uh, later on for if you want if you're interested in the details but just a few milestones. So in the early years 20th century one of the first systematic time diary study that uh, could be identified was one looking at peasant households uh, in Russia uh, in which uh, people were uh, already trying to understand uh, how farmers were spending their time in order to uh, help uh, modernize uh, agricultural production. Uh, similar studies, uh, but with another scope, were carried out by the Fabians uh, in London uh, with a view to uh, try and understand uh, how people in poor and women who were uh, seen as uh, uh, mostly responsible for the household at the time, uh, how women in poor households were spending their time and how um, maybe things could be improved for for, for them uh, by amending the way they spend their time. Uh, further down the road, uh, similar studies were carried out by Soviet economists uh, at the same time as the scientific organization of labor was uh, progressing in capitalist societies. Uh, the US Department for Agriculture, also USDA, uh, spent some time looking at how farm workers, especially around the time of the Great Depression, spent their times, and also later um, educated uh, women. And so and it was the idea of uh, understanding changes in uh, gender roles in the household. Uh, 
uh, in a more uh, market research type of approach, um, the BBC conducted uh, listener surveys uh, as, as early as I understand uh, in the 1930s, uh, the the view the, the objective was to uh, obviously see how people would spend their time in order to best tweak and tailor the programs um, that were uh, being produced, uh, and not to mention uh, the pioneering mass observation studies that was carried out in the UK, in which uh, everyone or a large portion of the population was asked to uh, fill in a diary of what they were doing, uh, of what they did during a single day. So just an example, a series of anecdotal, but maybe also uh, uh, exam yeah, examples showing that uh, there's been an increase in interest for um, time diary uh, time diary, the way people spend their time over the course of the 20th century. So as I've already said, we want uh, people did that or organizations, governments, uh, corporations did that in order to better understand uh, or monitor economic productivity, uh, to better understand and control labor force uh, behavior, um, sometimes also to feed into uh, social uh, and in the case of socialist economy central uh, planning of the economy but it was not just limited to uh, um, socialist or, or communist economies yes understand uh, consumer behavior uh, investigate uh, social issues as uh, was the case of uh, the fabians and uh, if we want to really, really uh, uh, get to uh, uh, the founding father of sociology, we could do, we could see that as a, as a part of uh, the continued rationalization process, controlling, improving, optimizing uh, modern uh, societies. Okay, but now uh, enough of sociological theory. Let's look at uh, the. Um, the actual empirical studies as they developed uh, over the, the course of the uh, 20th century. So the really uh, important milestone uh, in the development of time uh, diary studies uh, was Alexander Salai's The Use of Time. Some of you may have heard of it. It was really a pioneering studies conducted in the 1960s you have to imagine, so it was in the middle of Cold War, uh, but still this uh, researcher who was actually a mathematician, Hungarian mathematician, decided to uh, set up a consortium of a research team in 12 countries on both sides of the Iron Curtain. And uh, with a view to uh, study the way uh, their uh, or people in mostly urban Households spent their time. Uh, it is pioneering because of this uh, large scale multinational uh, approach. And it is also pioneering because uh, this is uh, how the now broadly followed uh, structure of time diaries uh, was uh, invented. So in time diaries in which uh, people are asked to f fill in diary, in which they, yeah, they uh, look at um, uh, what activity they do at each time point, uh, where they carry the activity, with whom uh, for a 24 hour period. Uh, so, that was a study carried out in the 1960s, and the book, uh, The Use of Time, was published in the early 1970s. Um, the a second important milestone in the study of time uh, use uh, was the creation uh, in the 1980s of the Multinational Time Use Study. Uh, by Jonathan Gershuni, so who's still uh, uh, co-director of the Center of Time Use Research. 
and, and to this day remains the main source of harmonized stem use data. So it's basically comprises of 55 years of uh, study, worth of study, uh, about a million uh, time diaries in 30 countries and 30 and 70 surveys. I, I'll come back to this in, in a little while. Uh, it's, but it's not by far the only uh, comparative study that is uh, around. So there's the United Nations ICATUS that is growing in importance and recognition. And there's the Harmonized European Time News uh, study. Um, each one has a different uh, purpose slightly. Uh, I'm just going to go back to this in a moment. And then uh, uh, apart from this multinational effort at uh, designing uh, harmonized comparative data, you have uh, also uh, a lot of single country uh, time diary studies that are, or surveys uh, that are regularly conducted. Uh, the main or the largest ones uh, are probably those from countries such as uh, the US with the American Time Use Study or India, the Indian Time Use Study. But there are lots of other countries in which uh, time uh, diary studies are uh, conducted. Uh, I may be able to show a few things here. Um, so that's the website of the uh, multinational time use study. Um, just uh, to show you if you're interested. Uh, so that show you an idea of the countries uh, that are covered um, by the harmonized MTUS data. And this is a, a, a large chunk of the of these studies are uh, freely downloaded downloadable if you're interested. <laughs> um, it's oops. Another one. Uh, I think I had the. I ah, yes. here's the. Oops, no, that's not what I wanted to show. Yes, so that's the page of uh, HITUS. So HITUS is basically the EU or the European Union's uh, version of harmonized uh, time use survey. It's a series of definition about common norms that uh, EU member states have to follow when producing um, time diary data. And I think there's a requirement for EU member state to produce, yes, um, time use studies at least every uh, 10 years, which increasingly gives rise to an interesting uh, uh, depository or repository of uh, comparative data. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've just shown uh, the, the web page of the MTUS. So yeah, this is just a, a, a focus on uh, the most important fact about it. I'm not going to spend more time on that. So now, Okay, so we've had a, a broad overview of what uh, kind of time use diary uh, studies have been uh, conducted so far. But uh, what do a time use survey actually look like? And I will take the example to talk about this, the example of the uh, 2015 UK time use survey because it's a relatively good quality study and also it's closer to us. So the 2015 UK time use study whose data you can download uh, freely from the UK data service is made of about uh, 16,000 diary days um, 
produced by 10,000 uh, respondent in 4,000 household in the UK. So everyone in the household that were sampled uh, and who was uh, age eight and above could fill in the survey. Uh, in order to have data uh, that's representative for the whole year, so uh, it was uh, the survey was conducted uh, throughout the whole of uh, that year, so not just a, a couple of weeks or months, um, and uh, maybe in a way to have a first understanding of what time diary surveys are about. It's basically made of two components. Um, on the one hand, there's uh, an individual or person level uh, survey in which the traditional questions people are asking surveys were also asked to respondents, such as what is your age, what's your job, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also, indeed, a time diary. So, and for the time diary, uh, people were asked to fill in uh, as minute if they wanted uh, as minutely as uh, a 10 minutes in 10 minutes interval uh, what they were doing uh, over two 24 hours time periods uh, usually uh, it means one day at the weekend and one weekday uh, both of which randomly uh, allocated so in from the point of view of the time diary Therefore, the unit of observation is not the person anymore, but it's the day. Uh, so this time in time slot is also called the resolution of a time diary. Not all time diaries have the same resolution. Some are uh, less precise than others. So there are time diaries that have 15 minutes, for example, uh, uh, resolution. So... Now, what is recorded in time diaries? So the first thing that's being recorded is, as uh, I'm sure you are already aware, uh, what people are actually doing, so what their activity is. And usually most time diaries uh, are made of uh, or asked about the main and secondary activity. So what are you doing but if you are doing something else at the same time what are you also doing main secondary activity i'm eating dinner and watching tv or i am um, talking to uh, my child and at the same time uh, as uh, stroking the cat second uh, series of information is about the context of uh, the activity uh, so where was it taking place was it at home, at work, somewhere else, indoor, outdoors? Another important piece of information that is common in almost all time you survey is the co-presence. Who else was present as I was, as I or the respondent uh, was uh, conducting this activity? So was it uh, family, and if so, who? Uh, children. Uh, people uh, uh, foreign uh, year to the household um, or even co-workers. Um, so these are these four uh, elements are what is really the core information uh, that is provided in uh, most time use surveys. And any unique combination of these by convention is called an episode. So each time uh, some a combination, a unique combination of these changes, you, you uh, change. Uh, to another episode. I will uh, show that a little bit later. Uh, back in 2015, uh, the UK uh, time use study innovated uh, in a number of features by also recording whether activities were conducted uh, uh, while using a device. So it was not just uh, uh, were you also looking at a device while doing the activity, but were you conducting the activity through a, a device uh, as the um, 
this was a time where one was beginning to really look at uh, the way we were using uh, such devices as mobile phones, for example. And then another uh, important uh, kind of data that was collected was uh, immediate uh, well-being, something that was, yes, uh, developed uh, by Kahneman, for, uh, among others. So a measure of enjoyment. So in addition to uh, the activity uh, that they were filled in, people were also asked to rate uh, the level of enjoyment they experience while carrying out this activity, which opens the door to a really interesting field of study of immediate well-being as opposed to uh, the traditional um, life satisfaction based uh, measure of uh, well-being. And of course, one of the key thing about um, this uh, and other time use uh, survey is that they rely on uh, harmonized nomenclature. So uh, at the time the diary was filled in uh, as uh, by hand, so people were literally writing on a, on a form what they were doing, and this was then recorded uh, by. Um, uh, the survey company, uh, but um, they were following or uh, by uh, recording the the activities recorded by people. They were following a harmonized nomenclature, which was uh, indeed the harmonized European uh, one hitters that I've uh, already mentioned. So that's what uh, diary. Uh, pen and paper diary uh, looks like. So, and it's indeed uh, drawn from the example that were provided to the respondent of the 2015 UK time use uh, study. So you can see that it's basically like a table, which each 10 minutes uh, episode, or oh, 10 minutes uh, slot, sorry, uh, appearing as a line, and each one of the dimensions uh, of the time diary that I've presented appearing as a colon. So that's the colon for the main activity here, colon for the secondary activity, uh, that's the device colon and uh, co-presence, et cetera. And you can see at the, uh, that the last colon with uh, uh, a range of uh, from one to seven is where people were um, asked to rate uh, their level of enjoyment of the activity they were carrying out. So uh, something interesting here, uh, which you may have already uh, understood is that obviously the fact that we have a 10 minutes resolution doesn't mean that people uh fill in something new every 10 minutes. Some uh, of the the episodes uh, last more than 10 minutes or the activity lasts more than 10 minutes. Um, and you, th there can be a difference in the degree to which respondent uh, uh, are, uh, conscientiously feel their, fill in their time diary. So we have people who are a bit lazy and who don't feel, uh, feel it, uh, many uh, activities uh, in their diaries. For example, uh, six or seven, I just got up, had breakfast, went to work, etc. Uh, or by contrast, people who are very, very um, detailed and provide uh, sometimes 25 plus um, episodes and activities uh, in their time diary. So what are the common uh, estimates that researchers uh, derive from time diaries? So the most common ones uh, are, uh, as I'm sure you can gather, the time we spend on activities, the duration of, of, uh, of activities. Uh, and that's uh, of course uh, that opens the um, the way for really interesting comparison between genders, between social groups, of the way uh, of the duration of some uh, activities by comparison with others. Uh, then there's the sequencing, that is the order 
uh, through which they take place uh, throughout the day, um, which can be also uh, an interesting field of study. Think about meals, for example. And then you can also look at the probability of occurrence of activities on typical days given the characteristics of some people. How likely are some people to be working on a Sunday, for example? Um, and then, uh, yes, you can also, uh, as, a, as I've said, compare the importance for example, in terms of occurrence or amount of time spent, uh, compare the importance of activities uh, between people. And of course, change over time um, between surveys, uh, since we now have been collecting time diary data for uh, some time now. So this is uh, maybe a, a, a very um, basic example of what you can, uh, the sort of thing you can uh, look at or research with time diary data. So what what is it? So it is uh, it's presenting some data for the UK uh, across uh, 50 or a little bit more than 50 years time frame showing uh, the amount of time respectively women and men uh, spent on four broad uh, types of activity, sleep and personal care, leisure activities, paid work, and uh, unpaid work. And what uh, does it show? Well, it shows maybe the first thing, I don't know what comes to your mind. The first thing that came to my mind when I saw that for the first time was things look pretty stable. We don't seem to have spent, to, to have changed very much uh, in the the amount of time we spend sleeping or even on leisure and recreation activity. On the other hand, there's a really, really major difference uh, in the way uh, back in 1961, uh, men and women spent their time in paid work. And of course, there's a the major change uh, here is that men spend uh less time on paid work than they used to uh women spent more time clearly more time in paid work than they used to but that is not fully uh compensated at all by a decrease in the unpaid work uh that they do um so yes just a, a write up of what i've explained here um Yes, so that's um, uh, basically the the conclusions I've just um, I've just described, and maybe yes, to to the the fact that we are uh, looking at uh, activities over twenty four hours mean that whatever we uh, look at, it will always add up to uh, fourteen hundred and forty minutes. Okay, so uh, I will now present another type of uh, analysis which is more which looks more at uh, the sequencing of uh, activities throughout the day and this time we are losing, using uh, a slightly more complex um, typology of activity we are moving from four activity uh, to uh, eight activity okay so that's uh, what is called a tempogram. And the good news is we will learn next week how to uh, do something like this. So what does it show? The X axis here, the horizontal axis show time of the day. And the vertical axis is the proportion of people engaged in what one of the eight activities uh, here that are described here. So these two uh, plots here show the, the proportion, uh, the, the mapping of, of uh, these 24 hours period, respectively for men and women in 1961 on a weekday. And of course, 
you can see that uh, the main difference uh, that uh, was really visible is the the way um, women were doing a lot of or was spending basically half of their day um, during the daily hours, uh, day, daytime hours, uh, doing uh, house work, cooking, cleaning. Um, as opposed to uh, men almost exclusively uh, doing uh, paid work or, if younger, uh, education. Uh, such plots also is interesting because it shows the rhythm of the day. So you do think you obviously um, do some sleep, personal care uh, at the beginning of the day. Then you are engaging in some activities. Then you have a break, and then whoops, you start again uh, engaging in activity. And then in the in the evening, you spend more time, uh, either uh, unfortunately for women at that time uh, on housework and paid work, uh, or indeed uh, leisure. And uh, what is also interesting is the way that leisure. Uh, was structured so men spend more time on looking at watching tv basically whereas uh, women were engaging also in other types of leisure activities now let's jump back let's jump to 2015 and what can we see well there's more of uh, there's a bit of a change as you can uh guess um I won't go through uh, through all the details here because I'm running a little bit behind. But uh, I think the main uh, lesson here is that if there's still a discrepancy between the amount of time and and the the, prop the propensity for men and women to be engaged in paid work at any point, things are the differences are narrowing. So that mirrors, in a way, uh, the other plot I showed earlier. Uh, the, the, the vertical bar plot. Uh, the other thing is, the, as you can see, the, the, there's been a, a collapsing a little bit of the neat uh, bumps that we could see for 1961, which means that the the day of the typical days of people are becoming more and more heterogeneous. People the, having invariably they, their break at lunchtime or the same for the same amount of time, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is uh, is decreasing. And also, you can see here uh, that uh, leisure uh, takes place uh, at also other times of the day. Uh, than just uh, the, the evening narrowly defined, as was the case in 1961. Okay, so to summarize, the this overview uh, I've shown that over the course of the 20th century, there's been a, a clear rise of interest for trying to understand the way men, women, and household uh, spend their time. There's been an increasing uh, time diary data collection, especially from the 1960s onwards. And we have now uh, a significant amount of data that allow us to uh, do some interesting comparative uh, time use research. So time diaries, as I said, record primary and secondary activity in their context, location, co-presence. And uh, the first... Uh, uh, observation we can have from looking at some of these comparative data over time is that we can see both stability and change in broad daily types of behavior uh, and the big area of change being uh, the division of paid and unpaid work between genders. So I will stop this presentation here. Uh, maybe I should stop sharing now. I am going to uh, maybe uh, move to the second presentation. So in which we are really uh, going to uh, look a little bit deeper into uh, the structure of time diary data. And you're going to see that some of the uh, questions you were asking are uh, hopefully answered in uh, this 
presentation. Okay, so uh, given that uh, this is a type of study with uh, a number of specific uh, data and uh, uh, recording, so there's some uh, specific vocabulary that is used usually by time use researcher. So to look at three key notions, <clears throat> activity, and uh, we've just talked about that. An activity is simply what uh, someone uh, in a time diary uh, records as uh, its main or its its main uh, or indeed secondary uh, action. Um, so. You can have two types of, uh, and I will show an example later. You can have two types of uh, recording this activity. So either in the pen and paper uh, diary I've showed earlier, people just write down what they are doing and then it's recorded. Or in more advanced um, a type of time use surveys, online time use surveys, uh, then you uh, pull you select an item on a menu pull down menu or uh, you tap in or tap it on the on the screen of uh, your device um and yes so uh, multitasking is usually recorded in uh, time use studies people are offered the option of uh, filling it up to sometimes to three uh, simultaneous activities mm -hmm. and it's usually also left to people uh, to respond and to decide which activity uh, is uh, the main versus secondary one. Uh, of course, there can be some social uh, desirability there because uh, when you have a father who says that he's uh, looking after a child and watching TV, uh, it may be a bit of a cliche, but what is really uh, the primary and secondary activity? Sometimes there's some uh, room for interpretation there. Okay, so uh, that's an activity. Uh, an episode, by contrast, uh, is uh, a co unique combination of uh, the main four type of variables that are collected by time use survey. That is primary activity, secondary activity, co-presence, and location. And just to, to show uh, an example here uh, in the slide, I show how uh, we can uh, move from one episode uh, to the other, uh, whilst, uh, for example, during episode one and two, the activity is not actually changing. So for, for I can I can start by reporting that I am watching TV whilst uh, eating crisps alone at home. So that's one episode. But as soon as someone joins me, uh, as soon as my son, for example, joins me uh, in the room, uh, uh, then that becomes uh, another uh, episode. And uh, e even if uh, my main activity, uh, watching TV, doesn't change. And then, of course, if the main activity, or for that matter, the secondary activity changes as well, then uh, that's, again, another episode. And the duration of episodes uh, may vary from uh, a very short amount of time, 10 minutes, to much more. You have respondents uh, that who report uh, very long uh, periods of or episodes of uh, paid work, for example. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the episodes uh, that is very common uh, to last for several hours is sleep, uh, sleep at night, obviously, uh, uh, because nothing changes much in, uh, in uh, during people's sleep time. Okay, and then uh, the third concept, we've already come across it, uh, is that of time slot. Time slot is simply the minimum duration of uh, an episode, which uh, and also the resolution of the time diary. Okay, now this plot here is uh, a way of illustrating <clears throat> the data structure of 
time diary surveys in a simple way. And of course, we are talking here about the time diary data because, as I've said earlier, time use surveys have also a person level questionnaire component that uh, is more akin to uh, traditional surveys. So here we have just uh, starting from the uh, the more specific level. So we have the time slot we have talked about, but these time slots uh, can be or are indeed embedded uh, within episodes. And then the episodes are embedded within the days uh, of the respondent. And the days uh, that are part of the time diary, the diary days are indeed themselves also embedded within people, within a respondent. Most of the time you have uh, two days per respondent. Uh, less often you have one day or sometimes you may have seven days. <clears throat> and there, there are a number of times you survey that have been asking respondents to keep a time diary for seven days. And then, of course, respondents can be also or are indeed uh, embedded uh, within household. And depending on uh, the survey design of the time diary survey, you these last three levels can be identical or uh, can differ. Uh, if I am correct, uh, the American Time Use Surveys uh, looks at one day per respondent. So in that sense, the, the data uh, is collected uh, or, or, or at a um, person level because we only have one day per person. And in the case of surveys in which only one person uh, is uh, asked to fill in the survey per household, then the, these three levels uh, coincide. So we have a single day of a single person within a household. In the case of the time use, uh, UK time use survey I mentioned earlier, these are all different because we have several people most of the time interviewed by households, several respondents, and for each one of them we have uh, two days of data. So that's the, the basic structure of time diary uh, studies. Okay, so now in terms of uh, files. So as I said, uh, we have uh, different types of or different ways of uh, recording uh, time diary data. Uh, but in most of the case, alongside the time diary, there's always in so, under one form or the other uh, individual file or person uh, level data in which uh, basic or less basic uh, socio-demographic characteristics are uh, recorded. And then uh, some surveys may also provide day level files, or which in the case, uh, for example, of the uh, multinational time use studies are uh, called aggregate files. Uh, so in such uh, files, each line of the data set records a day, um, so which means that uh, there are often two and sometimes more lines uh, per uh, respondent. And these data sets uh, usually comprises some uh, pre-computed uh, variables. So typically the time spent on some activities so that uh, maybe researcher is uh, statistically minded uh, can just uh, uh, compute estimates for the data without uh, having compute to compute the duration themselves. Uh, and also, uh, they may include some uh, questions that were asked about the, the day uh, to the respondent. So for example, some time diary survey asked a respondent, was this, was this particular day for which you filled in the diary a rushed day? Or did you feel stressed? or uh, 
uh, is this a normal day, a typical day? So these are day level variables that would also be in such a day level file. Uh, and then uh, all the version of uh, the data or, or, of time use data may also include uh, time diary data in wide formats. Uh, I will come back to this uh, later. Okay, so the the most uh, so two type of file that one comes across often when downloading time use data: individual file, normal uh, survey data, or classic survey data, and then day level file with some uh, pre computed aggregate uh, variables as well as day specific information. Okay. And now a third type of uh, data structure and file that uh, you will find yourself uh, uh, having to deal with uh, when downloading time use data or time use survey is episode level files in long format. So the long format simply means that uh, the level of observation uh, com by, by contrast with uh, the day level file, the, the unit of observation, the line is an episode. And so therefore you can have, uh, you will uh, have several, sometimes many uh, such lines, rows in your data set. Uh, per diary day and uh, by extension per uh, respondent. So depending on the person as I've already mentioned, uh, you can have more or less uh, episodes uh, reported on a typical day, uh, but uh, usually on average people report 15 uh, episodes. So this file format, this long file format is quite intuitive, uh, uh, but, and that's the reason why <clears throat> in all the survey it wasn't uh, commonly used, it requires more storage space and computing power than uh, data in the wide format. The wide format uh, is basically a format in which each uh, uh, episode is recorded in as a variable as opposed to a row in a um, uh, a data set. So the, the table there shows uh, in a really uh, summarized way what uh, an episode uh, looks like or an episode, uh, an episode file in long format looks like. So we have episode numbers here. We have the person number, the day number, the duration of the episode, and uh, of the, what the activity consists of, as well as the start and end of episode. So, what is the what do these numbers of start and end mean? They simply mean uh, cumulative uh, minutes uh, starting from uh, zero uh, until um, 1440. Uh, which is the basic way of uh, calculating time in a time diary survey. So this is the beginning of a day of someone. You can see here, the first episode uh, is some sleep, six hours of sleep. Uh, that's uh, 360 minutes, followed by a 20 minute shower and a half an hour breakfast. And uh, yes, I didn't show co-presence, but we could have had <laughs> a difference in uh, co-presence during this time. So that's a typical uh, episode uh, level file in long format, and we will be working with such uh, a file in a moment. Okay, another way of uh, working with time diary data uh, is uh, to consist in simply uh, dealing with slot level data sets. So each line of the data set uh, consists of um, 10 minutes time slot, if 10 minutes is the resolution of the time diary survey. Uh, they are not that common because uh, 
they require a lot of storage, more than episode files. And uh, basically, they are not strictly necessary, maybe uh, except for some specific type of analysis. But such slot level uh, data have uh, uh, so each ops each uh, time diary is comprehensively um, recorded uh, in such data set. So for each time diary, we have four one hundred and forty four lines corresponding to ten minute slots. And uh, yes, uh, a slot uh, ID is uh, necessary. And another uh, thing to keep in mind, and that's not uh, specific to time slot uh, data, is that time use surveys usually consider that uh, the day begins at 4 a.m. and it's, ends at 3.59 a.m. This is because uh, for some people uh, who have a certain atypical type of uh, work schedule, uh, it is easier to uh, consider uh, to, to, to uh, leave the late night as part of the previous day rather than a new one. Okay, so these were the most uh, common uh, type of uh, data structure. For the record, I will also mention the more, uh, uh, dare I say, historical uh, data structure, which is uh, the wide format. So the wide format uh, has a data structure that is similar to the aggregate file I mentioned earlier, in the sense that each line represents a day. <clears throat> and, uh, but by comparison or by contrast with uh, data in the long format, uh, either time slots or episodes are represented as variables. So which means that, uh, so in, if we consider the time slot case, we would have uh, a first variable uh, uh, for what the activity in time slots one, uh, and then uh, and so on until activity for time slot 144. So which means that you would need 144 variables to record uh, the primary activities, 144 variables for the secondary activity, 144 variables for uh, the co-presence, and 144 variables for uh, the location of the activity, which may be a bit cumbersome and uh, less intuitively uh, easy to understand as a time diary in long format. A modified version of the same logic consists instead of having a time slot variable, uh, uh, you would have um, uh, episode variable. So you would have uh, activity for the episode one and then uh, and so on until uh, the last episode. And of course, in that sense, you would the number of variable uh, with non-missing data would vary from respondent to respondent because uh, the number of um, uh, episodes varies between respondent and uh, time diaries. Uh, but given the way our uh, computer works, uh, it usually is faster for computer to uh, compute or uh, deal with uh, time diary data in wide format. It matters less now, and that's why it's probably uh, as computer becomes more powerful, have become more powerful. So that's why probably it's uh, used a little bit less. Okay, uh, I think I have, yeah, it's uh, something I've already showed in a way. Um, so the typical variables you find in most time diary data set uh, are variables that record primary, secondary activity. They will have different names depending on the data producer. Uh, so in the case of episode files, uh, because of course, uh, 
unlike time slot data, the duration is not implicit. You will have the episode duration. Uh, you will have the time, uh, so usually start and end start time, um, or incremental time uh, if it's a time slot. Co-presence, location, and then uh, also uh, if it hasn't been uh, removed for uh, protection against uh, data disclosure, uh, day of the week, month, calendar date, uh, and uh, whether this was filled in as a first diary or, or second uh, diary. And as I already said, there are uh, other ways, other things that have been uh, collected more recently, information about whether people felt rushed on the day, uh, enjoyment, device use, and then work-specific uh, data structure that I will uh, cover next week. And now let's move on maybe to the way uh, activities have been uh, and are uh, standardized. So, uh, as I said, uh, until recently, uh, activities have been uh, recorded on pen and paper uh, diary, which was historically uh, a costly way of conducting survey. And this is also part of the reason why you have comparatively, comparatively sorry, fewer time use surveys than other surveys because it's they are more costly to administer. Uh, nonetheless, it's indispensable to standardize activities if you want to carry out uh, a robust and uh, comparative research. And so there, there's a proliferation of uh, norms and guidelines. You could argue that uh, inverted comma Western nomenclatures, uh, such as the uh, MTUS hatus or the American Time Yesterday, are quite close. Uh, and others, uh, such as ICATUS, uh, are a little bit different in order to reflect the a more diverse way people uh, spend their time outside of uh, the Western world. Um, to give an example, so that is uh, the beginning of uh, the heaters. So you will not, uh, you will note, sorry, that uh, as with other nomenclature, you can have different degrees of uh, precision. You can look at three-digit uh, activity in which you have a relatively detailed uh, description of uh, of your activity. So washing and dressing, personal care service, using a personal care service, etc. versus uh, one digit, uh, which is uh, uh, other personal care here. So that's just, uh, no, it's it was two digits, sorry. The, the one digit is personal care full stop. So that's uh, an example coming from the harmonized uh, time use, European time use study. So by contrast, and uh, this is a, a, a clip from uh, uh, the Indian time use survey nomenclature. And uh, it is interesting because uh, it shows uh, a gr much greater uh, detailed uh, spend on uh, record recording uh, agriculture uh, ag agricultural activities. Given, uh, of course, the importance of uh, agriculture for the Indian economy uh, still uh, now, uh, and it is something that you you will not find in. Um, Certainly not in that degree of detail in the harmonized European time use survey, for example. Uh, there is a question uh, from Carol. So what things would be included in personal care services? Uh, well, I suppose that uh, that would be things where you pay someone to uh, uh, look to, to take care of you, for, for example, uh, 
people that would be uh, probably going to a uh, hairdresser uh, and things like that. Uh, or if you are an elderly person and you have a, a paid for care at home, that would also be uh, under that category. Uh, if you go uh, to the, the the original document uh, of the HITAS, uh, th there's much more detail than obviously I'm uh, I'm giving here. Okay, uh, then uh, another example from the uh, time use um, the American time use survey, uh, and again uh, the the. ATUS has uh, this interesting characteristics that it's it's much more detailed than uh, the European versions or the MTUS version for that matter. So you can go as far as kissing hello goodbye to someone, meditating, which is something you uh, usually don't find in most of the time you survey. So it's it has a really uh, narrow or rather specific fine grained. Uh, definition of activities, but of course, uh, the, it supposes that you would need to have enough uh, respondent who are filling in for uh, that uh, level of details in their uh, diary. By contrast, uh, the MTOS nomenclature is uh, made of fewer uh, categories simply because the main goal of MTUS is to harmonize as uh, many uh, time use national time use studies as possible so um, uh, that comes at the cost of um, the precision of what is uh, being measured so that's uh, 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 yes an example from um, uh, the MTUS documentation of the, the type of activities that you are looking at uh, or that you can uh, compare countries that are part of MTOS uh, with. And uh, of course, I, I suppose there's, as a as time use researcher, there's a trade-off to be drawn between um, really specific high quality data, which you will probably only find by looking at a single or limited number of countries or broader, uh, more vague, uh, but also uh, data, but on the other hand, that allows you to uh, compare uh, countries and also maybe countries over time. <clears throat> I wanted also to show you maybe uh, yes uh, before I move to uh, how to work with data uh, to show you an example of online uh, time diary if I find it yes it's here so um, the Center for Time Use Research. Um, uh, as well as other research centers, have been experimenting with other ways of administering um, time diary uh, or recording time diary survey. So that's just an example of a, a online time diary survey here. So that's an instrument. Uh, that's not really the the, the latest version of uh, this online instrument because uh, it's been. So this one was designed uh, before uh, people started looking at um, uh, device mobile phone based um, uh, time diary uh, instruments. Uh, so it's uh, you can see the the the, the shape of the screen shows that it's been designed for laptops uh, but there are now mobile phone versions of uh, comparable instruments and they are really versatile and um, they are currently uh, being administered so the, the latest version or a latest version of the UK uh, time use study currently being uh, administered by Natsen has been uh, collected using um, 
such a, an instrument. Of course, there's a limitation here. And as you can guess, uh, if you are not able anymore to uh, writing what you're doing, then you're more constrained in the dive. So the diversity of what people feel in their time diary is uh, uh, constrained. OK, so back to uh, the presentation at the end of the presentation. So uh, now how, uh, in a very concrete way, um, how do we produce time use estimate from time diaries? So the simplest way, if you're not very uh, familiar with uh, working with uh, data, or if you just want uh, some quick estimates, is to or could be to simply uh, look at pre-computed uh, aggregate variables in uh, the survey you're interested in. So they may already have been indeed computed by the data producers for you, and you just need to then look at uh, your means or, or distribution. Uh, um, functions for, for these um, uh, variables. But if you want to compute, and that's what most researchers uh, will want to do, uh, to compute your own, then that usually entails four steps. So first of all, uh, you need to uh, record or flag uh, the time use activities in the original episode uh, that set you are interested in. Uh, so you, basically, as, as you can imagine, given the large number of activities recorded, you need or one needs to uh, simplify one way or the other uh, the original data so that uh, you can you know, one can produce uh, intelligible results. Uh, and then uh, once this has been, the second step consists in summing the time uh, or adding the time spent on these activities over uh, the 24 hour period or it can be for the period of time if uh, that's your research interest so within day and uh, also maybe uh, within person uh, and then that at that level uh, at that stage sorry you are already able to compute uh, descriptive uh, statistics uh, next step uh, cons could consist in merging that diary level data in the, in the diary uh, whether it's episode or, or the uh, file with the person level uh, information you're interested in to pro then produce uh, comparisons, uh, for example, by gender, age, uh, so, uh, social uh, status, etc., etc. So these are basically the, the four typical steps one would follow when conducting, um, uh, producing time diary estimate of durations in this case. Okay, so uh, that is the end of this second presentation. Um, so uh, before we move on to the practical, uh, I would like to ask you again: Is there? Do would you have any questions? Is there anything that is unclear? Hello again, everyone. So uh, has everyone managed to get access to the data? Has are there any issues? The way I suggest we work is the following. So as you've seen, so the data itself consists of um, two data sets, a uh, uh, day level and uh, uh, episode level uh, data set. And we will uh, be working uh, with them using the uh, our syntax. Um, now, <clears throat> if you, uh, what we are going to do now, or what we are going to practice, is uh, described uh, on um, workbook uh, that is available on GitHub pages, and I have shared the link here. So um, I am going to share my screen again. So that is the um, workbook. 
which is basically uh, an annotated R code uh, that uh, I am going to uh, to demonstrate now. <clears throat> um, if you're not familiar with uh, this type of format, uh, each box here, uh, which uh, has the R syntax, can be uh, copied simply by clicking on the little uh, notepad icon here. If you click here, you can uh, then paste it uh, readily into uh, our own, uh, your own, sorry, uh, our uh, interface editor. So <clears throat> I am uh, going to demonstrate this using RStudio. And as I uh, said in the workbook, uh, I am just keeping things simple. So I'm just uh, working with a two windows um, version of uh, R Studio. I'm leaving the the other two uh, aside for now, so that we can just focus on uh, the actual syntax and um, the the output. So is uh, is this clear for everyone, or uh, are there any issues? Okay, so let's start. <clears throat> uh, so the first bit is uh, uncontroversial if you are familiar with R. So we just clean up uh, our workspace here, making sure we remove every uh, object. And then we load uh, the libraries that we are going to need which is the player as uh, 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 data manipulation library, uh, ggplot for uh, nice plots, and Haven uh, for importing uh, SPSS or Stata syntax. Uh, most of what we are going to do today is uh, relatively basic, so relies on, for the rest, yeah. on uh, base R functions and libraries. So the only bit that's a little bit more difficult uh, depends on uh, setting the working directory that's suited to your own uh, computer. So in my case, on the Windows computer I'm working now, this <clears throat> is where my uh, working directory is. And you will notice that uh, the data is still uh, on my computer is still within another data folder here, but uh, you can adapt it to your own uh, or to your own needs. So once this is, so I'm going to run this. Okay, I'm just checking that it has done what I was asking. Get working. Yes, that's the right director. So the next stage consists in uh, opening the episode data set, so MTOS teach app .dta. So D .dta means it is a, a file in a stata format. Uh, so what this, it's uh, Im imbricated or embedded comments here. So the core of the command is a haven uh, command read underscore dta that uh, converts the uh, stata uh, data set into a haven object. But as we want to keep things simple, we are converting this uh, haven uh, object for now into uh, a data set that has uh, only uh, uh, that that is a that is a data frame. Okay. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, but then we also want to clear up a little bit the data to keep things as simple as possible. So we remove using dplr's uh, pipe here and select function. We uh, remove uh, variables uh, that we are not going to need. <coughs> uh, so the wave indicator, because we don't have longitudinal data, a core 25, which is a a nomenclature of activities with smaller, a smaller number of activities than uh, 
the main uh, MTOS ones. And we also, given the type of analysis we're going to do, we also uh, remove children. And it's hopefully opening the data. If, you, if I'm too slow <clears throat> or too fast for your own pace, feel free to do things at your own pace and following uh, the instructions on um, the workbook. Okay. So now I have the data. I can have a quick initial look. So what do I have? So what is the size of this episode of this episode that set? So I have one million eight hundred thousand uh, plus um, episodes and twenty variables. So there's a relatively large number of observations for the number of variables, which is not uncommon for um long type of uh data or data in long format so the next thing uh we can do is uh but i suppose each one may have uh their own um habit is maybe to look at the variables that we have so for example if i type names app so that gives me the names of the uh, variables uh, that are in the data set, but as they are stored in the data. If by contrast, I type LS, that would give me the alphab alphabetical list of the variables. What else may, uh, may we want to uh, look at? Um, well, we may want to have a, an initial feel uh, for the data. So let's go for it. And indeed, we can see that these are the first six lines of the data. So what can we see? We can see that the, uh, the these first six uh, episodes uh, come from the Spanish study from 2009. So these are, un, uh, unsurprisingly, all about the same person, the same day, household ID, person ID. If you're unsure about the meaning of these variables, uh, keep hold on the variable description I have uh, provided in uh, with the data. <clears throat> so the year uh, the data was collected, uh, and that requires a little bit of comment here. Uh, but just let's go to the main episode variable. It takes a little bit of time because there's obviously lots of uh, observation. And that's just show the basic frequency tables of um, observations for the main activity. And even if you're not looking at a uh, code book, you can see that it's uh, most common activities such as sleepings are likely to be coded too, because this is, these are ones which have the most, the largest number of observations so, and meals as well. Um, so we have, that's the main variable. Um, if you're a little bit uh, more seasoned, a more seasoned user of, uh, R and Haven, uh, and you haven't converted uh, as I as I've done it here uh, the data frame into, uh, or rather the Haven object into a data frame. You may be able to uh, to visualize the Stata uh, labels as well, with plain English labels. Okay, so that's. The main activity. I would be curious to see if it's going to work. So Haven offers a way of optionally visualizing the level of a variable or factor variable. Um, so I'm using here the same function as I've used previously on the whole dataset, but for just the main activity and also. Uh, on uh, uh, look incorporating the label using the s underscore factor as opposed to s dot factor, which is a base uh, function, allows to uh, not only convert uh, an existing Haven uh, object into 
or a variable from a haven object into a factor, but also to uh, use uh, stata labels, uh, value labels as levels of the factor. That for, that's for the technical bit. Um, but as a result, you can see uh, the first six or, or what correspond to the first six uh, episodes for that uh, person. So sleep and nap uh, uh, and then meals, wash, wash self-care and then uh, some uh, walking, which is not uh, surprising. Okay. So if you want more details on the variables, you can ask for are to show you its class and you show it will show you the different component of the of that object. So the last one being the actual numbers and the other two corresponding to the variable uh, la value labels and variable label. Uh, for the anecdote, uh, I think there's an option as if you say that, if I'm correct, Yes. So if you specify both as an option to S factor, it also, in addition to the actual uh, value label, it gives you the actual uh, underlying numerical code. So that allows you to, or that is sometimes easy, uh, an easy way to uh, having some code book information without looking at the documentation. Yeah. So for example, you can see that walking is activity code 43. Okay, um, now uh, let's keep on exploring. Um, yes, it's uh, empty with data. So what country do we have? So there are different ways of exploring data. I'm pretty sure you have your own. Uh, and also, if you have, if you find better ways of doing things that I'm doing uh, in the practical, uh, that are more uh, uh, efficient coding, involve more efficient coding, feel free to suggest things as well. I would be more than happy to discover new new ways of coding. Okay, so let's look at the country in the data. Okay, so that's just so uh, the number of observations we have for each country. We want to have a look at the variable. It's a character variable, so it's not a factor. So uh, the, it's an alphanumeric variable. Okay, and we have uh, a lot of observation from France and Spain. Uh, and the UK, and a little bit less from uh, the US and the uh, Netherlands. Okay, country. But then uh, what else uh, can we uh, look? We may want to actually uh, look at uh, what country we have, or what country data we have for each uh, year. So, mm, it's quite simply, I can just copy here the code. Let's just do a cross tab. And again, there are different ways of doing cross tabs in R, but I'll just use that one uh, using the xtab function. So in the xtab functions, you uh, need a formula. Uh, you use, you specify your variables using a formula um, format. So you need a tilde and uh, the variables or the, the variable sing in the singular or plural are on the right hand side of the formula object. So here it's a cross tab of country by year for the app uh, data set. And we can see that uh, Yes, some data is more recent than other. The data for the UK actually comes from the UK time use survey I've talked about. But uh, you can see that there are different years even for the same study. It's actually re uh, recover or, or uh, accounts for the fact that even uh, if a study is uh, conducted or 
uh, is seen to be taking place in a given year, the actual field work may span over um, the calendar year. So the 2015 uh, UK time you study, for example, uh, actually took place, I think, between July 2014 and July 2015, even if it's um, labeled in 2015 study. Okay, so how uh, I proposed uh, uh, to create a study variable uh, in the data to um, allow us to identify uniquely each uh, study. So I'm creating a study variable, uh, which is uh, the concatenation uh, using the paste function of the respectively country here and survey variable. The, you could use different things as a separator. It can be a hyphen or just a, just a space. And I can look at the result. And now we have a clearer way of identifying studies. OK. Now, something else we may want to look at now that we have a uh, unique study ideas is uh, to have uh, a look at the number of days each study uh, encompass. Um, so I'm just doing a cross tab here of ID, which is uh the variable that records the diary number um so if you have a single day diary it's a constant for one and then uh, your if you have a two days diary your first diary will be coded as one your second uh, diary day as two etc so what we can see from here is that uh the diary has uh, the number of diary days differs uh, between studies. So we have two countries for which uh, there was only a single uh, diary. So the Spain and the US. And uh, uh, we have um, France and the UK, which have the more common um two days uh diary uh, that i've mentioned before and interestingly the netherlands uh, has gone the full uh, seven day uh so week long diary so with a with a seven day uh uh it set <laughs> of course uh uh, the, that come having more days comes at the cost of having fewer observation uh, for a given day. So this is why uh, the number of observation for the Netherlands for each day is uh, clearly smaller than uh, for from the other those from the other countries. Okay, so now we have a, a sense of. Uh, uh, the number of observation we have or the number of days we have. Uh, uh, if you're not very familiar with R, I can show you that there's a easy way of uh, uh, getting the uh, uh, frequency, uh, not the frequency, the uh, proportions uh, or percentage for these results. <laughs> so if you embed uh, the XTAP function into a prop table, uh function and uh space find the option two for uh colon percentage that gives you and then multiplying the results by 100 to turn them into percentage that gives me uh, the for each country the proportion of uh observation for each day and i can run that to the 
it's to a single decimal to make it neater. And, and in most cases, except for France, the countries are being, uh, the days, uh, sorry, are, have just been observed uh, in a seemingly fairly balanced way. So uh, you have the same proportion of days uh, per day of the week. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so uh, as I uh, as I uh, said earlier, uh, we may or we may not want to uh, uh, look or use the more complex functionalities from the Haven package, but if we do, and we can uh, produce a relatively uh, neat uh overview of a person's day so here the code simply records new versions of the main uh activity variable the location and a simplified version of co-presence alone uh, which indicates whether the respondent was alone or not when she or he conducted the uh, the activity uh, and as factor with the value labels, the Stata value labels, which makes it easier to understand. So if I do that, then I can again uh, request uh, head, and that makes it easier to read uh, the day of a person. Okay. Uh, there are more uh, illustrations here of uh, such uh, exploration of diary data. Uh, so that's basically uh, using the print function. Uh, I'm just asking Stata. I think the yeah the print function is not strictly necessary if you work on the console version of the data, but it shows the the first twenty rows of the data. And uh, as you can see, at least the first 19 row showed actually the full day of that person. And that gives a, maybe a, a first uh, uh, first hand um, sense of uh, how a day can be uh, visualized in a, the day of a person can be visualized in a time diary. So you can see that the person yeah, sleeps obviously, then has some food, uh, does some washing and then cleans, walk somewhere, uh, prepares a meal, uh, and then engages in some leisure activity, prepare another meal, watches a film or TV, and then go back to sleep. That's a, a schematized uh, day uh, of uh, that person. Uh, now, Okay, so the, this is just an illustration, really. Uh, we there, there are lots of ways, uh, and I'm sure you you, you know uh, you have you have your own ways of exploring data frames. Yeah. Now, what I want to uh, demonstrate a little bit uh, or to illustrate in the time that we have left is uh, maybe have a first go at. Uh, estimating uh, durations uh, and uh, from from that time diary data. So, and in order to do so, we are going to work with um, the way uh, or the amount of time people spend doing uh, paid work. So I uh, will spare you having to look at the MTUS uh, documentation. Uh, the, the codes that or the activity codes we are interested in uh, when looking at paid work are uh, code 7 uh, until 13, covering respectively paid work in the main job, not at home, paid work at home, second or other job not at home, and paid work to generate household income. It's travel as part of work, work break, uh, other time at workplace. Um, so 
following what I've said earlier, uh, we first need to uh, tag or to record um, the, the episode level data so that we are able to, uh, yeah, to, to identify uh, these work or paid work episode. And yes, I know that uh, in the example here, I am using every uh, all the code between 7 and 13 as paid work, even if 10 is not paid work. But for the sake of this exercise, I will consider number 10 and paid work to generate household income as paid work. Uh, well, feel free to exclude it in your own syntax if you prefer. OK, so how do I do this? There are different ways of doing it. But in, in a simple example, as, such as this one, I'm just using the base R if else function. Um, so I am creating a, an episode level variable here that I call WKT, which takes uh, the value of the variable time, which is the, the episode duration, uh, if indeed the codes of main of the main variable activity codes are comprised between 7 and 13 or 0 otherwise so it's basically a, a variable that records the duration of work related activities so i'm just pasting it here and i'm running it okay and let's just check yes so we have a relatively low mean uh, but it has created a variable. Okay. Um, why is it so, why is the mean so low? Well, a reason, a possible explanation is the fact that uh, since we are working with episodes and episodes uh, of many people, uh, not all of which are actually working on the diary day. So we have lots of zeros. So a way of uh, looking at whether the work-related uh, duration we have coded is credible is to only look at the me at the summary for uh, those who actually did report some work on diary day. Still, it's quite small. Why is it small? In addition to what I've said, it's also small simply because. Uh, we are lo looking at the mean of each individual episode. It's an episode level um, mean or, or distribution, if you want. What we want to do here is, uh, or, or what we are trying to do here, is to compute day level uh, time spent in paid work. So that requires using... Uh, a little bit more advanced functions of uh, R. So I will rely on the group by function from the deep layer package, which is quite a nice uh, function. So what do I do? Uh, I simply ask, so I'm starting here from the episode, uh, from my episode that set. I'm then grouping it uh, by a number of variables. So study, household, person, day. It will have a different team. So I, I basically, I'm grouping it by day, unique days. And obviously that will have different meanings depending on the way the data was um, uh, recorded. So in some countries, uh, that will indeed differentiate between uh, these different levels. And in others, it won't make a difference because there was only one person per household with one day. Okay, so if I do this, I am creating, so grouping, and then the mutate uh, command creates a new variable, which I call WKB, uh, which uh, sums uh, per for each specific diary day, uh, these duration of paid work that we have tagged earlier. So I'm just running this. That was quick. <clears throat> um, and um, 
Yes, I can already ask for a quick summary. So, uh, oops, no. Uh, I can ask for a summary of, okay. So uh, I have done something wrong here. Can any of you uh, identify what I have done that is wrong? Feel free to add it in the chat or in the, does anyone, ah, a comment here. No, what, what's wrong here is the fact that I am still working with the episode data, right? So I have computed these, uh, it may at the end of the day not make a huge difference, but uh, I am actually computing a mean over uh, the whole series of episodes, whereas, uh the mean that I've computed is a day level mean. So I need to tell uh R that I want the mean computed only for um the a single day. There are different ways of doing this. Uh a way of doing this is for just retaining since we have values of the this mean uh, this uh, total duration um, for each episode, we we want to retain uh, the first episode for each day. Uh, oops. Oh, yes. Now I need to see how it's called. Uh, 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 that should be acronym, though. Ah, yes, I know what I did, what I did wrong. I forgot to specify that it was OK. So I can see here that's a slightly different and that's a correct way of computing a mean of an aggregate variable using day level uh, data. Okay, so we have an average duration of paid work, of daily amount of paid work with a mean of uh, about two hours per day. That's not very much. Hmm. Before I go further down that road, uh, I want to show uh, how this can be plotted. So I can, I show some code in the workbook where I can store the result of um, a computed mean uh, into an object that I can then plot. So I start with episode. The, the episode data. Then as I've done uh, using the base R syntax earlier, I filter, so I only keep uh, the first observation, the first episode really, the first row for each diary day, but it doesn't matter because we want uh, only uh, the mean computed for that aggregate variable. Uh, then I group the results by study. And then uh, I, uh, oh, I'm asking uh, R to compute the mean by of uh, working time per day. And that's stored in an object that's called res. So that's the result. So we can see some slightly different uh, daily means. So the US have clearly the longest working day and the UK the shortest on average uh, and uh, with the Netherlands somewhere uh, in, uh, in the middle. Uh, these type of data can be easily uh, plotted using the base R bar plot function. where I'm just asking R to uh, plot so the, uh, uh, all the data that's identified by all, and uh, also specifying maybe uh, title, so which is the main option, daily working time in selected countries, and XLAP, YLAP uh, for the respectively horizontal and vertical label 
axis. And yippee, I've got a graph, a bar graph representing these differences. So it's a first way of visualizing duration data. But still, you're going to tell me, and I wouldn't blame you for that, uh, that it doesn't seem like a very realistic way of looking at paid work if we have um, if we have um, a way, if we only have um, two hours on average per day. So there are two uh, issues that are uh, related to this. So the first thing is we need to uh, make sure that we uh, differentiate the results by uh, the relevant units of observation. So something here is we have so far looked at uh, the mean uh, duration of work for any day. But of course, a typical week is made, made, is made of a uh, weekend and weekday, and at the weekend, people work less than on a weekday. So what if I uh, look at uh, the result depending on weekend versus weekday? So this is what the code below does. So it creates a weekend versus weekday variable. And please note that the coding of the uh, weekend variable in MTOS follows the US convention. So first day of the week is a Sunday. <clears throat> um, and then the lines uh, below, uh, again, uh, I'm, I've just put it in a single chunk of code. But what it does, in a sense, is to compute separate estimates of mean working time, the same way we've done it before, grouping. So for EPNUM is equal to one. So for, uh, and then uh, on weekdays, grouped by study, and then uh, the mean uh, for uh, that uh, duration. So for weekdays on the one hand, and for uh, weekend on the other. So which means that, uh, so we are create, computing these two estimates and we are uh, adding them as a extra uh, column to the uh, data frame uh, or the, the results, the object containing the results we have already created. So if I run this code, I don't think I've created that. Okay. And I look at the results. Yeah, you can see, we can see really stark differences, unsurprisingly, because between weekdays and the, and the weekend. And again, we can, uh, try and plot these data. And uh, uh, we can plot these data using, again, the bar plot function. You will note that uh, for reasons to, uh, to complicate it to explain here, it's easier uh, if the row names uh, contain the name of the study as opposed to a separate variable given how a uh, bar plot functions. So I'm just pasting the code here. So I'm working. So th that's what I just said. I, I'm uh, using row names for the identification of the study. And I'm just creating a bar plot here. Uh, Whoops, why is it not? Hmm. Well, you have to trust me that the code works <laughs> when I run it on uh, as part of this workbook. Um, so that, that shows basically uh, the weekend 
versus weekday differences by country. And you, we will see that the main uh, European countries do not have very different durations. The US, by contrast, stands out with longer uh, working days. But now, uh, another aspect we want to have a look at. Uh, ah, OK. Uh, whoops. Uh, why do we want epnum is equal to 1? Uh, epnum is equal to 1 means that uh, since we are computing daily means, right? So we want to uh, this daily means. So we are we have um, created the, the daily mean variable uh, in an episode data set. So in effect, we still have a data set with a variable number of episodes per diary per person, etc. Right. So if I want to have um, to compute a mean that reflects or that gives the same weight to everyone, irrespective of the number of episodes uh, in their diary, uh, then I need to uh, select only the one observation per uh, diary, which is uh, the total uh, duration of, of uh, paid work uh, for, 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 for this diary. Otherwise, uh, not doing that may uh, affect the value of the mean that's being computed given the different the different number of episodes in the in the episode data set. So in effect, it's uh, uh, I am turning for the duration of that computation the episode data set into uh, an aggregate data set. Okay, so now the second. Uh, uh, thing we need to think about, and that's really something that is uh, quite fundamental when uh, working with time diary data. Uh, it is basically about um, what we are interested in, and there are two options. So the first option is uh, I want to uh, compute estimates that reflect the whole of my data set. And why do I want to do that? Because if I uh, compute estimates with all the data that is available and all the diary data specifically, then I can compute estimates that neatly adds up to a, a full day. Um, as uh, I, I showed earlier with this comparison of uh, typical days between 1961 and 2015. Right. But then, depending on the activity uh, one looks at, uh, it may uh, be affected by the number of uh, people who are not carrying out such activity. Uh, so it, it doesn't really matter, maybe, uh, in the case of activity, everyone activities everyone is doing, uh, typically sleeping, eating, uh, self-care, <laughs> if everyone uh, has an equal propensity of... Uh, uh, having a shower every day. Uh, but on the other hand, in the case of activities that are less common or not everyone does it, then that begins to affect the the, the extent to which the means or the uh, estimates we are computing uh, are informative or typical of the values uh, that people do. So in the case of paid work, and, and to go to the bottom of things, in the case of paid work, uh, there are, we either have the option or, of, as I've done so far, looking at uh, the mean of paid work for everyone in the sample, or for only those who reported paid work on uh, the diary day. So the nice, so the, the positive thing, if I start looking only at people who reported paid work, is the fact that I'm going to, and I'm going to show that uh, I'm beginning to have uh, estimates that are closer to typical uh, paid work or, uh, sorry, working days, uh, uh, as one can expect. Uh, but on the other hand, it means that uh, I am not, 
each time comparing uh, the same uh, sample because obviously I am only taking uh, the mean for people who reported paid work. So uh, to cut it short here, I am uh, repeating the same uh, series of uh, computation here. So I'm creating a new uh, object with uh, paid work duration that I'm calling RESW. Um, and I'm following the same logic as before, but I'm adding uh, an extra uh, condition. So I'm uh, specifying that I only want to uh, compute the mean for those observations where WKB, our daily total of paid work, is greater than one. So everyone who didn't wo report work, for example, most people uh, or a lot of people on Sundays, for example, uh, will not be uh, taken into account. So first column will be uh, these people, uh, everyone, and then uh, people weekdays and people uh, at uh, the weekend. And then I am following the same syntax as before to create uh, bar plots. And here we finally see results that are beginning to be a little bit more uh, realistic. So we can see now that the uh, mean duration of the working day has jumped to uh, between 450 and 500 for most countries <clears throat> minutes per day, which means uh, between six uh, seven, eight hours of uh, paid work per day, which is much, much more uh, realistic. <clears throat> and of course, the reasoning I'm following here applies to uh, any activity uh, you may be interested in uh, researching. So uh, having to do the choice between uh, only looking at participants, that's the jargon, uh, we would use for that versus um, uh, everyone in the sample. Okay, uh, are there any questions so far? Okay, so now I will quickly move to the last bit uh, that I uh, yes, we have 10 minutes left. So uh, the last bit that uh, I wanted to uh, demonstrate here, I will probably not have the time to do the, the very last one, but you will have, you, you can work on that on your uh, worksheet. And then I will uh, take question next week. So if we are uh, able to compute uh, estimates of uh, duration, then it's not uh, very difficult actually to, from there, compute estimates or prob probability of uh, participation, uh, at least in R, because basically the probability, as we've just seen, of engaging in paid work on a given day is simply uh, defined as uh, the probability uh, or in our jargon, uh, the mean of WKB being greater than zero. Um, and so we can similarly compute a, ma a data set, uh, which includes these results. So we'll just, uh, so I'm using the same logic, so creating uh, manually, so to speak, uh, an object uh, and specifying the columns here. So the first one is uh, the probability of engaging in paid work at all on a diary day. And the second and the third one uh, at the weekend. 
and each time uh, from the object created by um, the summarize function of the player, I am selecting only the the row, the, sorry, the column that creates the that contains the the result, so that I can neatly uh, pile them up into this single object. So, what does it look like? <clears throat> and of course, uh, it's all grouped by study S previously. So these are uh, probabilities of engaging in paid work by um, day of the week, as in weekday versus weekend. Uh, and you can see if you if we multiply this by uh, hundreds, uh, you can see how uh, it can read into percentages as well. And you can also see that there are differences, interesting differences between countries. Clearly, uh, people in the US much more likely, or I'm sure, more likely uh, to be engaged in paid work at any point during the week, for example. A little bit less so, but still more at the weekend. So we have these results. And again, uh, if we want to, we can uh, plot them uh, in a bar plot. Uh, showing how likely respondents in each country were to engage in paid work uh, at uh, any point in time. <clears throat> of course, this is just the beginning here. We are only, uh, I, I'm just uh, sketching or, or showing uh, how really basic computations can be made. But what we are really interested in uh, as a, a researcher is to uh, look at how these things differ by uh, variables we may be uh, interested in socio gender, socio-demographic characteristics. So, yeah, I have five more minutes, so I will go quickly through this. Um, so, what what the, what that means, or how that translates into a typical uh, time uh, diary uh, research workflow, is first of all you need to uh, get the uh, day level data or person level data, depending on what you have, which I'm doing here by opening the MTUS teach int data set, which has these data. And I'm storing it in a, an object that I call D. And uh, also, uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity, I'm creating exactly the same study. Uh, variable uh, resulting from the concatenation of country and survey uh, into uh, yeah, a study uh, variable. And I can see here, so I have 88,000 observations and more variables. Okay, so we have our individual data. Um, so the rest is uh, partly a matter of taste. There are people who prefer to create a small number of variables and then add it to the episode file. Others who just want to merge everything into a single large data set. Um, there, there's no really a, a right or wrong way of doing things. Uh, so what I'm doing in the, uh, what I've done in the workbook is to create a, uh, to simply uh, add uh, the work level, uh, uh, so, sorry, the day level uh, duration of work to the the existing uh, diary, uh, yeah, diary day level file. So in other words, I'm adding uh, my WKB variable to the D data set that I've just uh, opened. And I'm storing this as a new object 
that I call DT. Uh, and uh, I'm using the base R function merge, uh, which has a very straightforward syntax. So merge object A here, uh, or data frame A, uh, that I, have, I, have, I mean D, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, with the second one uh, using study household ID, personal ID, and diary identification as matching variables. And I'm also asking it uh, not to retain unmatched observations. It should work. Okay. So uh, it's done what we want to. We can check. So it's dropped a few observations which have didn't match, which have data that didn't match. We can check that it has kept the data, the variable with we wanted to add. And yes, we have now the our WKB variable into that data set. Okay. So we now have a day level data set that has some duration of paid work that we have computed ourselves. What if we want to look at gender differences uh, along in paid work uh, by country, day of versus uh, day of the week versus uh, weekend? So I have, I suggest here we. Uh, create a new gender variable, which is a little bit uh, more explicit than the one contained in MTOS. So it's quite straightforward. Uh, I'm just uh, adding the value label, uh, the state value label, so that now the variable appears as directly male, females. There we are. And then I am going back to estimating uh, paid work. And um, now I'm using maybe a more formal approach to this. So I'm just uh, looking at the mean of paid work for people of working age in most countries, so 16 until 65. Uh, I am still grouping uh, my results by study, obviously, but also now by gender, and uh, whether it's a weekend or a weekday, and uh, simply asking for the mean. <clears throat> of course, uh, needless to say, uh, uh, keep in mind that in some cases, it may be more relevant to, instead of asking for the mean, to ask for the median or, or the measure of central tendency. Uh, so that computes the value of interest yeah, that can be ignored. Uh, I think that, and I can look, and I have a series of values, some of which differing rather markedly from other ones. Um, I suggest to uh, look at um, the ggplot uh, uh, function, which is uh, one of the uh, jewel in the crown of the R software. It's a really uh, advanced and really good uh, plotting function. Uh, and to use this plotting function for uh, displaying our data here. So um, if you're not familiar with ggplot, uh, it functions as a series of layers in which uh, you specify the, it's called the aesthetic AES, the main parameters of your graph, uh, the X variable, the Y variable, so X being as before the study uh, and why being the uh, time duration. And I'm also asking it to uh, create a difference by the gender variable uh, that I've created. So it will be it will be using different colors and different groups in effect. And I then uh, specify that I want my plot to be a bar plot. 
uh, and uh, with uh, the bars uh, being uh, side by lying side by side. Uh, this line is uh, not very important. It's just where I manually specify the colors for greater readability. Uh, also, for greater re readability, I'm asking for uh, an, uh, an inverted graph, as in where a horizontal bar graph is opposed to the vertical one, so that the label here uh, display in a nicer way. You can try without it. You'll see what the result looks like. And finally, uh, I am asking to have one facet, one subplot uh, uh, by for one each category of the weekend versus weekday variable, and that is what this result looks like. So we can see uh, as uh, can be expected, duration, uh, relatively clear differences in the duration of paid work, including of, um, uh, oh, oh, sorry, uh, the marked difference in the duration of paid work of people who did work on the day. So that doesn't take into account the gender differences in uh, economic activity, but still, even when looking at people uh, who work on uh, on the diary day, we can see as uh, one can be expected uh, differences in the duration of paid uh, of the paid uh, work throughout the day, and this is obviously uh, related to what we've seen earlier in uh, differences, gender differences in the amount of unpaid work that men and women do. Women do more unpaid work and therefore have less time to do paid work. Uh, this translates into short uh, working days, which can be formalized at part-time work. Um, in the Netherlands, lots of, uh, the Netherlands is one of the countries with the largest proportion of uh, part-time worker, so that shows clearly here. And interestingly, these differences are less marked for people working at the weekend. Okay, so that's uh, uh, maybe, I'm going to stop here for today. Um, for, before I close the session, I wanted to ask, uh, are there any questions? So in the code I have demonstrated, um, so we will be exploring this further uh, next week, looking at more specific stuff. If you have any question, uh, feel free to send an email uh, and I will uh, mention it, uh, or I will discuss it uh, at the beginning of next session. And as I said, uh, now that I can see that we have a smaller number, uh, if you have a uh, substantive research interest or a project you are thinking or already working on in relation to term use, feel free to drop me an email and I would be more than interested if you were presenting it or talking a little bit, nothing formal uh, at uh, the end of session next week. And also this won't be recorded uh, so that uh, if you feel a bit shy about being recorded, uh, the, uh, this last session will not be recorded. So I'd be more than happy to hear about people's research interest. Okay, so uh, yes, Emma reminds us that uh, uh, it would be nice if you filled in the evaluation survey that will help us plan future events. But uh, I hope I will see you again uh, next week at the same time, so the 17th at 2 o'clock, where we will do more exciting things about uh, tempograms, for example, and uh, estimating proper survey estimation with time diary data, among others. I hope you are going to have a nice evening and uh, see you next week. Thank you.